Good evening, everybody. My name is David Goodman. I'm the director of the China Studies Center. You are joining a webinar, a roundtable webinar on the two sessions currently recently held in Beijing. Before I hand over to Professor Louise Edwards and a, a cast of thousands to discuss this topic, um, may I acknowledge the land on which the University of Sydney and indeed other universities who are participating in this webinar are based. They, these were lands that were never ceded and belong to their traditional owners, both in land and in water. We recognize the traditional owners of the land there and their elders, um, past, present and emerging. Uh, it's very nice now to be able to hand over once again, as we do this time every year, to Professor Louise Edwards uh, to chair a session on uh, the two sessions that were held in Beijing recently. Um, I'm going to let her introduce the participants, and um, I'm not going to say anything else. Over to you, Louise. Okay, lovely. Thanks very much, David. It's a huge honour to be here, and I too would like to welcome you all here, and especially our three presenters. I'm actually coming to you from the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation uh, down here in Melbourne, and I'd really also like to acknowledge their elders past and present. But also make a special mention, since we're in a university setting, to Kulin Nation youth, because um, it's really their success and their contributions that will help uh, build Australia's unique success in the world in the future. Now, our speakers today are an impressive bunch of Sydney academics who've dedicated many decades to understanding China and to communicating their knowledge to government, industry, media, and not least of all, to students. And they're, of course, still very, very young, um, but combined, their wisdom um, uh, makes that of scholars many years their senior. Um, we'll have time for quick Q&A at the close of the session, so please feel free to insert any questions you have into the um, Q&A box um, on Zoom, and we'll um, try and get through them um, before the close of the session. But first, let's go through our speakers. Um, Professor Bin Chin Lee is a Professor of Social Policy Re at, the, at the Social Policy Research Centre at UNSW, and she's a global expert on social policy and governance. She's also an honorary professor at the University of Sydney and is now chair of East Asian Social Policy Research Network um, as recognition of her, her um, global role. Her current research includes entrepreneurship and welfare provision, community-based old age care, collaborative governance and social services, disability inclusion in China and Australia as well. And she's frequently consulted um, as by, she frequently provides consultation to international organizations on various um, social policy aspects um, in China. And she'll be focusing on the societal aspects of our, of the um, uh, two sessions for us today. Uh, Dr. Wei Li is um, a returning from, um, to, to this, um, we also, uh, interacted in our two sessions program last year at, uh, and so she's a return feature. She's a senior lecturer in international business at the University of Sydney Business School and she's a core member and co-developer of the KPMG Business School research team and leads the Chinese Outbound Investors Survey Project. She's also worked as a researcher on water conservation and renewable energy for the World Bank the Chinese Ministry of Environmental Protection and Renmin University in China. And Professor Yingjie Guo is Professor of Chinese Studies and an international reader, a leader in research on the connection between politics and culture in China, especially in terms of national identity and class. He received his BA and MA from Shanghai International Studies University and a PhD from the University of Tasmania. He's also a fellow of the Australian Academy of Humanities, and in 2023, the Humanities Academy released a major report called Australia's China Knowledge Capability, and that's available online if you search for those terms um, at, to get an update on what is Australia's national sovereign capability in China knowledge. Now, just before we get into the details of the most recent two sessions, um, I'd like to ask Yingjie to give us an overview of what the meetings are, how they fit into the Chinese political landscape, you know, why are they important? Why do we have these discussions about the two sessions? 
Thank you very much, Luz. That question is important, especially for um, for colleagues and some in the audience who are, are probably not familiar with the background of the two sessions. Um, just to begin with, the two sessions refers to the uh, the annual meetings of China's top advisory body and its legislature. Uh, the political advisory body is called uh, it's, it's a mouthful, Chinese Political People's Political Com Consultative Conference. I don't know how many times I've said it, but I still get it wrong. Its session this year lasted from the 4th to the 10th of March. China's legislature is called the National People's Congress. Uh, its session happened about the same time, although it was a day late and finished a day late too. Um, the two sessions are the most prominent annual political event in China. Ordinary Chinese people probably don't pay much attention to these sessions, but China watchers all over the world um, usually comb the speeches, documents, and social uh, and, and reports for clues about China's politics and economics as well as the government's economic, social, and foreign policies in the year ahead. And most of the policies affect the lives of ordinary people, needless to say. The two sessions this year are all the more important given that they are the first of the unprecedented political or leadership turnover last year that you probably all recall, and the state of China's economy right now. That's a brief, very brief introduction okay. to the two sessions. That's great. Thanks very much. Because it's you know, we can't assume everybody knows everything about the Chinese political structure. But I want to stay with you, uh, Yingjie, and quiz you on the political dimensions a little bit longer, because it's commonplace for foreign commentators to excuse their lack of knowledge about the Chinese political system by resorting to the sort of narrative that it's an impenetrable black box. And so how can we possibly know anything about it? But what frustrates me about this uh, easy quip is that it can often just mask laziness. You know, we can't be bothered finding out about, um, you know, about what is going on in Chinese politics or our media commentators might not have the Chinese language skills to read the vast amounts of material that are actually produced and disseminated in China about how appointments are made, what policy decisions are made. And so we just end up resorting to this idea that it's a black box of secrecy and therefore I don't have to know anything about it. And to me, that sort of smacks of this 19th and 20th century, early 20th century sort of Orientalism, when we just sort of talked about inscrutable Chinese or this um, uh, unfathomable mystical China. And we've just replaced those kind of ideologies with a sort of, oh, they're communists, they're one, one party state, so therefore it's a black box and it's secretive. And so we don't have to know anything about it. Now, you know, it's that just... I think is a problem because it deters ordinary people or even educated ordinary people from making an effort to understand more about China because they sort of go, well, what's the point? It's all too hard. You know, if even the experts can't do it, what hope is there for us? And then the other side of it is it can also just be an excuse, excuse for our own laziness, as I said at the start. And it's like, oh, all those Chinese names, they're so hard. You know, why would I bother? So I don't think this is really good enough. I think we need to know more and we need to make the effort, even if it's really, really hard. So I'm hoping today, with your help, you'll help us decode the politics of the two sessions a little bit more. So what would you say would be the main takeaways in terms of political developments that came out of these two, the most recent two sessions? You are absolutely right. I can't agree more. And there, there, there are many... Uh social commentators and even China scholars who say it's too hard. And there are also people who say, oh, this, some things are not important. I've been told by senior colleagues in China studies that the CCP's ideology doesn't matter. The constitution wow. of the People's Republic of China doesn't matter. Okay, so the, the, you, have, you have that. It's, it's, it's just very dismissive. But actually, I, I, I'm one of the people who read the People's Daily just about every day, <laughs> just to look for messages and look for signals. All right, this is my, my topic sentence. Reading 
the two sessions is a bit like reading a novel with, uh, <laughs> with a rich and complex subtext, as well as a seemingly simple and clear text. You just have to read and try to pay attention and interpret what's on the surface and what's implied. Okay, the political keynote of the text is obvious enough, right? President Xi Jinping and the central leadership are very eager to dispel deepening concern about the challenges that China faces. And to boost, on the other hand, confidence in the Chinese Communist Party's leadership and the China's economic development. That's the keynote message to me. And that's probably the number one political takeaway. The, okay. challenge, the challenges include economic pressure following the COVID-19 pandemic, rising protectionism and the suppression from Western powers. These are original words that some of the Chinese leaders use again and again, and risks associated with the real estate sector. That's another economic challenge. Local government debts, we've all heard about that in the media. It's in the Australian media all the time. And some small and media-sized financial institutions. All right, these are only some of the challenges, a long list of challenges. But what are the, what are the responses of President Xi Jinping and the top uh, leadership? How their responses to these challenges appear to concentrate on the economy. But the review, what I think is a distinctively political approach to economics. And this is probably has been pointed by other people as well, but we need to go into some, some detail to understand it. Uh, in other words, what I'm saying is that much of the politics seems to revolve around the economy but it is a revival of politics in command. And that approach expands the role of the state in the economy, positively, I'm not saying it's all negative, positively by promoting economic development and then negatively by tightening control over the economy. So what do I mean by that? Okay, let's look at that, the two sides of it. On the one hand, President Xi stressed during the two sessions the importance of developing new quality productive forces. So this, this is new. This is in something what the Xinhua calls dictionary, not dictionary, dictionary. This is a new wow. term in dictionary. Yeah. Um, so it's 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 developing new quality productive forces and uh, as an intrinsic in requirement and the focus of promoting high quality development. We've heard that term is not so new now, it's getting old, but it's still promoting new quality productive forces as part of promoting high quality development. Uh, um, and this is actually something that is being repeated again and again. And this can be seen as a recognition that the old economic growth model um, primarily driven by high cost labor, extensive yet inefficient investment, external demand and excessive resource uh, risk consumption can no longer be sustained. And the China must actively cultivate new technologies, new business models and the further industries to enhance the quality and the efficiency of development. So, so can I just stop you there and ask you to unpack a bit more the new quality productive forces phrase? Like mm -hmm. this is talking about people, right? Yeah, like people, yeah. people skills. And what does it mean to someone, say, who's a young person unemployed and looking for a job? What are they getting from that signal? To, how do they become a new quality productive force? So learn new technology. Uh, okay. Because this is very much technology driven with innovation playing the leading role. So new quality productive forces mean advanced productivity. So you need young people and old people indeed need to, to get into new technologies. Oh, that is freed from traditional economic growth model and features high tech and high efficiency among other things. These are the new buzzwords, high efficiency, high right. tech. So the state will therefore support businesses to become more high end 
more intelligent and greener. Greener energy is another area and direct more resources toward disruptive innovation or oh, in, in, new innovation and then trying to catch, catch up with the West. So this is the new, what they call the new economic development model, right? Uh, uh, and it is not just geared towards high quality development, but also public well-being, social stability, and social harmony. So this will I will I won't talk too much about this. I'm sure Bing Qing will when he when she talks about society, but it is shows you the increasing role the state is going to play in economic development as well as as well as in society. So the government and the state will focus on planning and building affordable housing and advancing construction and public infrastructure for both normal and emergency use and the renovation of villages in cities. So this is part of the new real estate development model as well. I got a feeling that Wei is going to talk about this, but generally speaking, so then the, it's part of the new new development model, which includes a new real estate development model. I can go on and on, but in short, um, the way I can summarize it is that the visible hand of the state looks set to appear even more uh, visible in economic development in the, in the near future. Um, indeed, President Xi and the central leadership have attached greater importance to economic stability and the development as a foundation of for economic uh, econ uh, for political stability and social st stability. So, in other words, economic development is just not an end in itself; is a means to political stability and social stability. There, there are less obvious. Take political takeaways, which concern the continuing and increasing consolidation of power in the hands of the party and the president of the PRC, who is also the general party secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. Okay, so more government. We can expect more government and more, um, and certainly not a retreat in the leading markets run. It's going to be more government and that's going to be government that's concerned about balancing the economic and the social in a in a pretty serious way. If we went one level deeper then and said, well, what, this sounds like very much like a trend that was started last year. Yeah. And is there is this more of the status quo or is there something new that we need to pay attention to? What are the novel aspects in, in all of this? It's not really new. You put your finger on it, Louise. That is, uh, it's, it is a continuation of, the of a trend which began in, 20, in 2012 when President Xi became the party secretary. Uh, even though this whole process has been accelerating since since 2018, um, since the revision uh, of the, the constitution of the People's Republic of China. And since last year, because President Xi's power has been increasingly consolidated. And I talked about the, the leadership act, uh, turnover last year. Uh, for the first time, I think you have a party secretary who has no peers within the party or state system. So everybody is his subordinate or, or is, is a junior official with the exit of people like peers like Li Keqiang, Wang Yang, and, and so on and so forth. So this is really something that is remarkable. It's never happened in the Chinese Communist Party before. So we can talk about specific instances of this happening, the continuation of that trend and the increasing consolidation of power um, of the party and the president or the general secretary of the party. Okay, so the trend's actually sharpened. It's actually things that people anticipated are actually becoming quite quite apparent in, in, in the realisation of Xi's power. That's, that's uh, yeah, I think that's quite significant. And um, what, if we turn now to the uh, economic indicators, the top level economic indicators, Wei Li, can I can I ask you to 
you know, what, what, one of the things we do know about the two sessions is, as Yingjie actually said, is that international journalists and commentators are focusing really a lot on the GDP forecasts because pretty much all governments around the world are, you know, have China as their number one trading partner, are worried about what is that growth, uh, growth number going to look like for them. And they're hanging on this news. And we know that, um, you know, um, there was a... a you know, they wanted, to, but if we were going to go deeper than just the headline number, what does the GDP um, number, uh, what does, if we go deeper than the headline number, what is that the economic information uh, from this from the sessions tells us? Sorry, my question got all convoluted, but uh, please tell us about the economy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no worries. I, I think, um, well, we, we must acknowledge. I think um, the world is still recovering from the pandemic and um, the impact of COVID-19, as well as the shifting geopolitical tensions and uncertainties. I think that's also part of the reason why um, there's a lot of focus and emphasis on China's economic figures, uh, because up to now, still China is um, you know, one of the drivers for uh, global GDP growth for the last two decades. And you're absolutely right. So one of the most important announcements during the two session is the annual GDP growth target. I think this year there's less bit of a surprise in terms of the growth target is still set at five percent, and that's the same as last year. Um, and last year, I think um, we know that the GDP growth rate was fixed at five percent, and just say in this last year. Is just achievable. Um, and in the end of the day, we see that the actual growth rate for last year was 5.2%, slightly higher than the growth target. Um, this year, I would say, I think um, a lot of people is also arguing that as well, setting the target is the same as 5%. However, the challenge to achieve that fund growth rate is actually larger and bigger than last year. Um, we know that we discussed last year, you know, 2023 is the first year of reopening China after the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, in the sense of that 5% growth rate was considerably easy to achieve because there was a low base in 2022, where a lot of the economy was basically shut down. However, in 2024, I think we've seen that a lot of the major economic provinces, again, you know, now seeing them setting up the growth rate as 5 to 5.5% 5 .5 for 2024. Um, given they have actually achieved quite a lot of 5% growth rate in 2023. Um, so now when we start it as a higher base, how to achieve that additional 5% growth, I think it really requires higher efforts. And that's why I think recently we've seen some of the predictions, especially um, the most notable one from IMF, actually predict that China's growth rate this year was low to 4.6%. And beyond that, I think there's even um, a, a more further prediction in terms of growth would drop to as low as 3.4% in 2028. Mm. Partially, I think the reason is we discussed last year again some of the challenge, right? The, the decoupling and also China's slow down population growth and this being long-term challenge faced by the Chinese economy. I think the other additional um, problems or challenge have emerged particularly from last year was what happened in the property markets, right? And this has really led to risk in the area of real estate, uh, lead to the real um, the risk in local government debts is a big discussion now again, and also the small and medium-sized financial institutions, um, the financial stability has become a, a, a topic again that brings into a lot of attention from policymakers. I think the other thing that have changed also in 2023 is that um, there's also a recognition of lack of effective demand. Um, remember last year we talked about, you know, there's a lot of focus on actually how can we encourage um, consumer demands, increase the service economy, focus on consumptions. I think what we've seen recently is that China's CPI, that is the inflation index, has remained very low. So very different from what we see in Australia, that China is about below 1% for the last, um, you know, nine or 10 consecutive months. And the core CPI 
ECI has been operating at just under 1% for nearly two years now. So um, rather than what we've seen in Australia, there's an uh, inflation risk um, and China, I think certainly we've seen that there's a lack of effective demand and that further complex to issues that we're seeing at the moment in China. And that's why I argue, you know, I think a lot of people would argue achieving that 5% this year will be more difficult than what we see in this last year. Now, in terms of some of the policies being announced in the two sessions, in terms of how they're going to address that, I think there are two focus. Um, the first focus is certainly, you know, that it needs to be a stronger economic stimulus plan to come into the economy, uh, particularly with real estate. Actually, the whole sector contributes to 20 to 25 percent of China's value added. So there's complex value chain and supply chain actually surrounding the whole real estate sector. So if the real estate sector is in trouble, so that means it will be really bringing a lot of risk. Um, for the whole economy. So there needs to be economic stimulus plan. But we also know that I think I, I believe that um, we don't know what our exact policies are, uh, but we know that I think um, there, there's not going to be massive economic stimulus plan like what we see in 2008 and 2009 in terms of investment into infrastructure. I think that has been made quite clear over the last few years, although there are rounds and rounds of speculation to say Chinese government is going to invest in lots of infrastructure again because the economy is not going well. But we've seen also rounds and runs so evidence that increasingly the government is less willing to use investment in infrastructure as a way to stimulate uh, the economy. Uh, but there's more and more discussion about there should be special measures to help China's property sector transition to a more sustainable size. For example, and also there are measures talking about expanding the scope of special local government bonds as capital funds, and also implementing policies on structural tax and fee reductions. And there's also a suggestion about, you know, whether government should buy out some of these oversupply properties that are in the market um, as a way to actually uh, increase um, some fundings go into the property markets, but also as a way that turn it into social housings that can provide to the um, to the population as a way to uh, provide extra uh, uh, um, extra uh, stock into the prop into the market. I think the other thing is um, linked to Professor Guo was talking about is that. Um, Apart from the economic stimulus plan, there's increasing awareness that um, as real estate market is going down, they need to be rethink about the economic model, uh, what would drive China for the next 10 years. Again, this has been discussed for a very long time. And I think most people remember that a lot of the focus had been on the service economy. So there was quite a lot of discussion about actually as, you know, export is reducing as you know infrastructure investment is reducing china should really focus on the service economy you know increase the percentage of service as a part of value added to the gdp uh, but this seems to be not working as well as is expected i think that's been the lesson being learned over the last couple of years. And what I see as um, the phrase that Professor Guo just mentioned about the new quality productive forces, you know, it sounds like a jargon in the end, but I think this, this is really introducing the background of, um, you know, if service economy is not going to replace the whole, you know, important role of the real estate sector. So what will be some of the other gross models China needs to focus on. And I think what is underlying that new quality productive forces is really the industrialization. Um, because in terms of when we see a lot of the traditional growth model is that when countries grow further, they turn from uh, industrial nations into more service nation. I think there's increasing awareness uh, within China now that um, China needs to be somehow, you know, um, 
uh, a voyage over over turning itself into a service economy, but really needs to as you um you know focus on the traditional industries or the industry sectors as a whole. So it still needs to actually grow itself as an industrialized nation, and that is why that I think uh, the term was um, really introduced last year in September when Xi Jinping really visited I think it was Heilongjiang province. Um, which is a very, um, you know, um, you know, used to be a quite a heavy industrialized uh, provinces in China, and he stated the importance of actively focus on industries such as new energy, new materials, advanced manufacturing, and electronic information, and that is one of the reason that actually um, again this year we seen that there's a new um, uh, a policy announced by the state council um, and talking about action plan for promoting large-scale equipment renewal and consumption goods replacement. So last year, if you remember, we were talking about the policy was just focused on large uh, kind of consumption goods like electric cars or fridges and TVs and encouraging you know, people to buy more of that. But this year, I think the focus have actually expanded to include large-scale equipment renewal. So I think that's where... Um, I kind of think that, um, you know, there's this shift in focus to, to actually acknowledging, you know, the complex global um, environment, but also acknowledging that China has developed quite sophistic sophisticated industrial clusters already, and they should leverage the advantage of that, particularly in producing machineries and also into generating um, goods that actually would meet a local demand and global demand. I think one of the examples has been used quite a bit in the media discussion was about uh, China was able to, in a in a few weeks or so, put into a production line for the for the health mask during COVID nineteen. So that that in some way illustrate the strengths of the Chinese um, industrial clusters and the production capabilities. So I think this is what seems to me in this year's announcement as quite new that to say, you know, rather than just get rid of the old industries and because they're polluted and everything, I think there's re-emphasize on, you know, industries being very important and the importance of actually now increasingly focus on new industries, but also introducing uh, digitization, AI, and all the new technologies to enable that um, industry industrialization. Um, but then again, this is nothing new, right? So if you look back to economic theory to say, how can you in, in, uh, improve productivity of a nation? Uh, one part of it was to say, you need to provide them with infrastructure. And that's what China has been doing for many years, um, you know, to the point that it's not very sustainable in, at all. The other thing is to actually really focus on high value industries and to actually enhance um, innovation and advancement in innovation into industry. So I think that's another pathway that China would like to explore maybe this year in terms of how can they, you know, really find new growth areas for the uh, for the part that is um, showing as decline in the real estate sector. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds to me like what you're describing is that China again is going to confound many of the kind of patterns that we've come to expect about development or economic progress, you know, that if, that if you go from the, you know, the factories to the service sector and then you become a rich country, but it looks like China's decided, well, maybe the service sector, we don't need to worry about that. What we can do is go from the, you know, the the making the, making the, the, the things in the factories and then go into this advanced manufacturing and, and advanced technology Sort of a tech uh, with the you know that wasn't available say to you know to uh, many other countries because the advanced technology didn't exist but now there is this advanced technology maybe China doesn't have to bother with the service stage it can just go straight into a new into a new economic trajectory and you know that I think will be a, an interesting lesson for many other countries who seek to develop from you know a, from a, a rural base um, which are of which there are many around the world in the global south. So I mean that's um yeah I don't know is that 
Does that tell you what you... I, I, I do agree. I think certainly it was not planned, you know, to, to move this way. I think China has tried this service, um, you know, economy for, for quite a few years. I think progress has been made. But I think the other thing is we have to acknowledge that a lot of the developed countries, you know, um, emerge from an industrialized, industrialized country into a service driven economy under the background of globalization and that means a global outsourcing is actually yeah. uh, a very wise move and it does reduce cost and it does actually increase efficiency uh, enormously i think um, at the moment what we're seeing externally for at least for china right the whole global outsourcing um, you know, moving factories into other countries, but it's not about actually increasing efficiency, but I think a lot of the movies to actually bypass some of the uh, geopolitical tensions or tariffs and under the background of deglobalization. So I think that external environment has also changed quite a lot, which also caused um, complexities in, in terms of for the policymakers in China to rethink its economic policy. Yeah, because you're shipping jobs overseas. You're shipping jobs to Mexico mm -hmm. or to somewhere else in the global south, yeah. Okay, well, th thanks very much, um, Wayley. We'll come back to you to talk about the international trade aspects at the end, but I want to move now to stay to Bing Chin and stay at the domestic, um, with a domestic focus. Um, it seems from what Wayley was saying that, you know, the, the lack of demand shows there isn't a great deal of confidence, you know, Yingju was saying that the whole political tone was to instill confidence in the people, but if there's still low consumer demand, it says there isn't a great deal of confidence among ordinary Chinese people. So what do we, you know, what do we know about um, what the government is doing in terms of improving at a practical level people's experience of living in China? You know, what, what are they actually delivering and, you know, um, Will this help with some of the the confidence and economic challenges that Yingjie and Weili have talked about? Yeah, um, thank you very much. And I uh, actually will echo on some of the uh, issues they have been talking about because uh, from the perspective of social policy, even though internationally people think always think that social policy in China is about China only, but it's actually linked to. Uh, sorry, it's about uh, uh, livelihood only, but it's actually linked to the politics and to the economics uh, very profoundly. And this year, what you can find, what, what you can see is um, this point is uh, getting much, much stronger than in the past. So, um, uh, for example, I give you uh, some examples um, in China. And, uh, of course, when in the uh, two sessions, when they talk about livelihoods, it's different from just social policy. It has uh, several elements. One is employment and uh, public education, uh, primary health care uh, or, or public health care and uh, um, cultural perspective and uh, sports uh, wow. and, the, and the children and also at the bottom, social security and social protection. And this year, there is an extra perspective. It's about um, domestic services. This is the first time this topic get into basically the care, home-based care. So, so that's like are... elder care in the home or child care in the home. Is that what you're talking about with domestic services? Uh, it's actually a mixture of uh, basically um, people come to your home to deliver to to clean the house and uh, yeah, okay. house cleaning yeah. and all these uh, different perspectives. And um, so comparing to what happened in the past and this year, there are several elements. One is uh, in the employment and the public education sector, uh, there is this whole uh, idea of uh, skills China and try to improve the skills of the people in order to prepare for the economic uh, a kind of a economic upgrading. One of the main challenges people have been talking about is that now you are trying to upgrade the economy and um, trying to introduce all these high tech, but a lot of people are still not working in the kind of a labor intensive industry. How are you going to deal with uh, these people? Are, are you going to fire all of them? 
And I went to some of the factories in Zhejiang recently. A whole factory only have two or three workers work, working in it. Wow, and, all AI. Uh, hmm? The all rest robots. are all robots. Yeah. Yeah. And um, not only it's not only uh, happening in this way, and also the government is actually pushing for the enterprises to go more in this direction. And then more and more people will become unemployed, even yeah. if there's no economic downturn, not to mention that there is. So um, so this kind of uh, where, where how are these people going to continue to survive? And um, in the economy, so this is a one main issue. That is uh, also why this um, one solution is for the older people try to upgrade their skills. So this skills China kind of, and another one for the younger people. Older, I mean, not very old. It's kind of a working age population. Yeah, yeah. not elderly. Also quite young. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then. For the younger, for the for the for the children, there will be kind of an education emphasizing on early uh, age, doing coding, and um, wow. yeah, doing a lot of skills based training in the school. And also another perspective is um, um, when the uh, 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 there will be in the higher education level, there will be encouragement of um, education and the industry. Uh, integration, integrated kind of education, probably a bit like uh, ARC linkage here. Yeah, okay. And basically, examining people working together with industries in order to solve uh, some of these kind of problems. And this is uh, um, on the uh, skills side. And of course, there is also the, uh, the issue of a lot of even people with higher education and still cannot find jobs. And then there will be, there will, they they basically before they they graduate their skills need to be upgraded already yeah. so um so all these kind of challenges require kind of a, um improved in the education system from the prime primary school to the higher education continuously and uh, then another perspective is um uh the, to help people to find jobs and uh, there, so there are two types of national platforms that uh, is uh, introduced. I think this is also linked to the digital economy. And the earlier uh, digital economy probably becomes somewhat exhausted. You just buy things online. But these days, there is more push towards nationwide employment platform, internet platform to encourage people to go. Uh, uh, and another one is uh, the education is also going to be provided on the nationwide platform. So, um, so these kind of uh, platforms is probably also part of the upgrading of the economy as well. That uh, I, I, of course, this is just my uh, my thing. I, I think it might be related. And um, the another uh, as several aspects is um, in the public health sector. Uh, in the previous uh, government, uh, in the previous um, uh, report, two sessions, it's mainly about uh, a preventative health care and also uh, uh, Chinese medicine and traditional uh, and the Western medicine uh, integrated, coordinated, working together. But uh, now there is a, a clear, stronger intention to make um, Chinese medicine to become the primary care. Uh, kind of yeah. become more dominant in that. So maintaining your health and in the communities and the Chinese medicines were considered um, is, is kind of promoted as a, playing a bigger role. And so it's a kind of the, preventative medicine, preventative healthcare, sort of don't get sick in the first place kind of thing. Yeah, oh, you, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. In the communities, if you, yeah. if you're sick or you are tired or whatever, you go to the Chinese healing center rather okay. than going to the medical so kind of a Western medical center. This is the kind of a more maintenance type of uh, yeah. care is um have a big push in the last uh, several years in uh, mostly in the uh, central China uh, area and now it's become nationwide. And uh, another type is uh, uh, rare disease. 
and emphasizing on, this is related to the upgrading again, emphasizing on the research of medicine that can deal with rare disease and also the uh, social protection side of it is trying to um, develop a social protection system because the parents suffering uh, from this, uh, their child kind of uh, expensive is um, a very important uh, uh, effect lead to poverty. So that is also the uh, children. If the children are sick, then the family suffers. Is that the? the yeah, but these yeah. are rare diseases. Basically, yeah. that the child, the drug is called orphan drug, which is usually really expensive. Yeah. Okay. And um, ordinary family simply cannot afford it, and uh, even this drug cannot cure the disease. It's quite often genetically related uh, yeah. problems. Yeah. And um, but but then once they have the disease, then uh, have the potential medicine either for relief or whatever, and uh, that is also can earn a lot of money. <laughs> In yeah, currently most of the um, uh, medicine come from the United States, so uh, so there there is more emphasis on this uh, side. And uh, of course, in the cultural side, uh, I, I went to also uh, travel in China recently. And uh, what you can observe very clearly is after the COVID-19, uh, people become more obsessed <laughs> of the natural environment. And mm -hmm. a lot of people also uh, leaving the big cities return to their small towns, also related to rural development. And they uh, are much more into this kind of eco-friendly uh, tourism. So uh, that is also partly related to the rural poverty reduction and economic upgrading, uh, several things combined together. On the social side, it's more about um, developing uh, tourism and uh, for people, for rural area to escape uh, poverty and for people leaving big cities can still maintain, uh, become self-employed and related to employment as well. And of course, in the sports uh, sector, that is also an uh, increased infrastructure building. So when we say that they run out of idea of what infrastructure is trying to build, it's actually sports. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, because it's also related to preventative uh, health, uh, kind of a, a health improvement. Yeah, yeah public health improvement. To, uh, so with, with, um, with all of these um, provisions, you know, like um, employment, public health, education, sports, yeah, uh, socials, uh, so you haven't you haven't covered yet um, social services and social protection, yeah, but yeah. with all of these things, are they being promoted to the population as kind of like, look, this is what we are delivering to you, and yeah. to, and in response, do people feel that is is being yeah. delivered? Yeah, yeah, I, I think that is a very good question. And I, I just said and another one that is very important <laughs> is that uh, for older people, the silver uh, silver economy and this yeah. silver hair or gray hair economy, and also for the child care and uh, support, improve the quality and uh, this kind of provision. And uh, we saw these kind of, uh, as you as you suggested, and uh, these are response to people's demand. Population is aging, therefore there need to be more uh, old age uh, care and services. And uh, uh, they want to have more children. <laughs> Not only, of course the government want to have more children and the people are still kind of, uh, what, even if they want, and it's hard for them to have, uh, uh, to have more children uh, related to their housing conditions, yeah. related to kind of a stress, they have lack of care, lack of support, all these. So then there are these solutions, uh, for example, uh, providing more domestic services, providing more health care and uh, old age care facilities in the communities and all these. But there is one important issue is that um, these are often, even though with some kind of discussion from the, but they are not often uh, evidence-based policy making. Uh. So when you, when the, currently the government want to have older people all to go to eat in the community canteen. So what you can see is uh, local authorities got this target. The purpose of course is to help older people uh, who would be able to, uh, do not have to cook at home. And so that if they do not need to cook, they don't need to go to uh, care facilities. That is the idea, uh, become uh, sustain their uh, independent living. 
But once this kind of policy become target, government targets coming to the uh, communities at the community level, it, it become this kind of hard targets, basically saying that everybody has, you have to come to it's the a compulsion. And, yes, <laughs> become compulsion. And uh, there is, there, there can be situation, let's say, if uh, the couple have a bigger age gap, the older one has to go to the community canteen to eat. <laughs> the other one has to eat at home because the other one is not qualified. So a lot of these kind of mismatch. And uh, also, after all, why do people have to eat in the canteen if they cannot cook? Food yeah. food deliver to their home. So they they need to, in terms of demand, you try to feed their demand, but how to deal with this, need more consultation and need more um, per people oriented kind of policy making. So that is a uh, one uh, a big challenge. Uh, well, it sort of comes back to what Yingjie was saying about, you know, there's going to be more government intervention. But if if the government intervention is not based on research, based on advice from social policy experts like yourself, you could end up with just these sorts of, you know, like target sort of you must come and eat at, a, at the canteen when you don't even need to. And, then you know, then the, the effort is wasted and the energy is wasted. So it is it is a real challenge rolling out social policy. Yeah. And and also of course there are uh, the the domestic domestic services you can also see it as a way of uh, uh, boosting uh, reemployment as well yeah and uh, helping people at home that is one perspective but it's also related to uh, uh, unemployed people finding their second career mm, I have uh, come across uh, my own parents are uh, using uh, people via the internet service and then bring uh, people to come to home to help them uh, to um, to cooking and all the, these kind of uh, um, house, household chore. And, um, but the reality is um, even in the government document, it says women's uh, service <laughs> sector. Why <laughs> can't men just do housework? <laughs> they also clean up. <laughs> so that is one very um, important issue. And next time, if I go back, I will try to talk to, talk to them. That's why right. <laughs> assume that it only yeah, women would do these kind of jobs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And well, of course, so the others is a bottom uh, lifting the bottom that was more or less similar to what's in the past. Yes. Lift, lifting the lifting the the poorest oh, wow. to a yeah. level of, of um, uh, less poverty. Yeah. I, I mean, one of the things that I'm, when I'm hearing you talk, I'm just thinking about rural-urban divide. I mean, a lot of these services, I can see them being rolled out, even in an imperfect form mm -hmm. in the cities. But what about rural China? I mean, it doesn't connect to what Yingjie was saying about villages in the city and urbanisation and, you know, and what Weili was saying about housing provision for um you know, for people who who need need housing and aren't going to afford the luxury high end uh, real estate, and what 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 what's happening for rural rural residents? I think in rural area is very uh, divided, and uh, in the richer provinces, and they are in incredibly uh, creative and um, um, uh, creating uh, get uh, creating support system for the older people, and also at the same time you have a. Uh, uh, people, middle-aged people coming from the rural area to the uh, kind of uh, richer rural area, like in Zhejiang, you can see that they are looking after the older people in the old, uh, in the these province, rich provinces, and the, the Fujian, you have all these. Yeah. Um, so they are kind of uh, uh, doing uh, much better than the poorest people who have, their children are left and they're um, the older people. And uh, so far, what they have been trying to do is um, trying to move some of those uh, older people living in the remote areas and to more kind of a closer to the urban area. Uh, yeah, okay. But still, uh, currently uh, in China, the main issue is there's not enough labor supply in the care sector. Yeah. So you end up having all these older people have to live uh, together. If you visited those places as a government government official for inspection, you will see all these older people. After you leave, they they all go back home, and yeah. uh, the 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 reason is there's not 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 sufficient kind of a qualified uh, care 
labor force. So um, currently there are some local government try to train people, but who currently, uh, uh, no matter how many people they train, they were sucked in by the bigger cities, uh, by the yeah. rich area. So um, they, this is still kind of a struggling. Well, maybe there's scope for the service sector to be developed in rural areas in a way that <laughs> maybe yeah. there's different from the, from the urban areas. Because the other thing that strikes me about um, about anxieties that we hear and in, in, in coming out from sort of ordinary people in China is employment for their young people. And um, I can't remember which one of you mentioned the even university graduates not being able to get jobs. And I mean, the point is that they're not getting jobs that they think they deserve. It's not that they can't get any job. Mm -hmm. It's that they, they've they earned these degrees and they expect a high quality job. Yeah. And, you know, with the last year, the two sessions, they we talked about the, the clamping down on the tech sector and those um, really tough 996 hours that people are, uh, young people were experiencing. So if you are a high quality, what, are the, what is it, new quality productive force, and you have a good university degree, and you're kind of going, well, I don't want to be treated just like a, a, a sort of IT factory worker, I want to be an innovator. You know, and I don't, and I want to be respected as an innovator. I don't want to just be seen as a cog in this AI wheel. You know, how is there anything happening in those terms, like to solve those kind of anxieties, it's rising expectations, basically? You know, people expecting better. Nobody wants to say about that. <laughs> I can, I can probably make a a, a quick. Uh, I, I, I noticed, I, I talked to a lot of students in the social policy sector, and they are also suffering from a lot of this kind of a situation. And uh, I sort of see that in the education sector, the, the uh, teaching entrepreneurship is not as thriving as much as here. In the universities already, um, entrepreneur, uh, of course, I know that in UNSW, they are doing a lot of entrepreneurship style training. But then when you go to the, uh, the Chinese universities, uh, you do come across some good university have this. And but a lot of not very uh, good universities uh, and, and are still teacher basically just lecturing on the students. So yeah. Uh, yeah. So not also, equipping the students for becoming these, um, I keep looking at this term, new quality productive forces, because mm -hmm. we need them to be entrepreneurs and create their own jobs in a way, rather than work for someone else. It seems that can be. <laughs> be the innovators. <laughs> well, yeah, it's that's tough. I mean, so it seems like, you know, if I've got this correct, the government's kind of in this two sessions, they've um, to a certain extent taken the temperature of the people's attitudes, people, popular opinion pretty well. And they're trying things, some that work, some that don't, um, to solve these these problems. But are there blind spots that the government has, or that that at least the two sessions hasn't really seen coming? Um, are there things that are just too hard, and so we won't talk about them at the two sessions because it'll be too embarrassing because you know we don't know what to do with them, and we don't want to raise the, we don't want to talk about them. Otherwise, people will even more become more and more aware of them. I mean, are there intractable issues that were ignored? Well, one of the difficulties I think is actually a disconnect between the top and bottom uh, in the decision-making process. Uh, what I mean is that um, ever since 2012, uh, a new phrase has replaced an old one. The new phrase is is top level design. Yeah. So the macro planning, the macro plan, the top level design is there. There's a vision, but then how do you implement that vision? That's left to local officials. And local officials um, don't really have clear ideas. So they do all sorts of things. Some work, some do not work, as, as you say. Uh, and it leads also to a lot of what the even the party acknowledges, admits happening on a big scale. That is uh, formalism and, and bureaucratism. So bureaucracy. Yeah. So people just performing performing this act. It's like, you want me to do this? 
I'm doing this. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. You're okay. I'm, you can't say, you can't hold me accountable. There's nothing to hold me accountable to. Yeah. But, uh, it's it, there. There is this disconnect that I see wherever I go. Yeah, and that's that's really a, a like you're not going to get that transition from a factory economy to a high end uh, innovation entrepreneurship economy if people feel that it's safer to be formalistic in their obedience to a, a plan or a policy, and then they just tick the boxes. I mean, we see that in Australia as well. You know that. People just okay. You want me to do this? This is stupid, but I'm going to do this job because otherwise I won't meet meet my KPIs and I won't get my promotion. You know, it just doesn't lead to entrepreneurial mm -hmm. spirit. And I think that would be a you know that that could be a real force for frustration if people feel their jobs are meaningless. You know, like yeah, sure, I've got a job, but it's a meaningless job, and I want to move forward. So you, yeah, well, that's that's really interesting. We've got sort of oh, I've run out. I looked up and now I want to go back to Lee, uh, Wei Lee now and talk about uh, international trade, trade relations. Um, so many of our governments depend on China trade, and we know they all breathed a sigh of relief when there was a return to the post pandemic. When post pandemic, there was a return to the sort of uh, moderately normal production in China because it's it helped alleviate the uh, inflation that was whipping around the world um, immediately after the opening up of uh, the global economy the reopening. And we know that Australian educational institutions are really very happy that we've seen a return um, to, you know, uh, um, Chinese students coming to uh, to Australia to help prepare themselves for a global future. Um, and I read yesterday that more than 1.02 million Chinese students are studying, uh, studied in foreign universities in 2021, and that number is only going to be huger now. So, you know, it's it's a return. Individual families are making the choice to spend their money abroad. That's good for some countries. But what are the prospects for more government-led and coordinated big trade in the current climate? What's the international trade environment as per the two sessions? What have they thought about it? Yeah, um, I just before I answer this question, I want to add a, a one additional point in terms of what's been missing out in the two session this year. Um, I think I believe that I think the support for the private sector, and um, particularly I think um, helping them to to make this into the 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 journey of industrialization is something that I think should be emphasized more because if we look into um, the, the nature of the manufacturing sector in China that actually probably you'll find more state-owned enterprise actually go into this large-scale machineries manufacturing uh, where a lot of the private sector actually are more users of those machineries rather than producers because a lot of the private sector has actually evolved into more consumer oriented um, kind of uh, manufacturing so particularly into textile right uh, electronic small electronic goods so i think um we we certainly would like to, um, to see more support into the private sectors um, in terms of making this transition. Otherwise, we'll see, um, again, a more unequal uh, distribution in terms of, of where the state sector will be benefiting more into in, in terms of this large scale industrialization uh, where the private ones would actually, um, you know, somehow lagging behind. Um, then mm -hmm. I think goes back to the international trade. Um, you know, what we've seen from last year is that the Chinese trade figure has gone up slightly, both in terms of, um, I think, import and export. Uh, I believe it's only 0.3% or 0.4%. So they managed to actually um, have an increase in exports um, as well as increase in imports. Um, I think the, the 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 focus for for the future is still remaining to be you know that China still wants export to to drive its growth because it still remains a very large significant contributor to China's GDP. Um, but we'll see that actually the areas where China would like to focus more uh, will be again more in line to what we discuss about this new quality, high quality or new quality production 
active um, kind of forces, which will go into areas like new energy, electric vehicle, uh, lithium batteries. So I think uh, the Premier Li Chang um, in the last months or so have already talked about this, the new three things that where China wants to push forward. So probably you've seen that there are more emphasis on certain high value added products to be exported. Um, and also geographically, I think certainly you'll be seeing um, a lot of pushes probably more towards the Bell and Road countries and not the major um, kind of US as well as, you know, potentially now we see in the EU market um, because we've just seen that actually there's, um, you know, the, 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 the new the new um, announcement about TikTok um, in, in the US and also this recent announcement about um, electric vehicles, you know, the anti-dumping uh, investigation on electric vehicles um, from China, from EU. So I think China have been over the last few years um, very actively uh, promoting trade with the Belt and Road countries, particularly the developing countries. And this can be seen as from China's overseas investment figures so um, that we have seen that investment into major developed economy has dropped uh, quite a lot. In my own area of research, I've been looking uh, for many years about Chinese investment into Australia. So I say the last few years is probably not uh, uh, not too, not very good when you look into figures um, about Chinese investment into Australia. But that actually mirrors stories into going into the US and to a certain extent also Chinese investment going into EU as well. But uh, from last year, I think the latest figure shows that actually Chinese investment into the Belt and Road country has, has actually increased. And um, that's a trend for the last few years. So I, I say that there will be more push also towards the Belt and Road countries, particularly, um, you know, places like Africa, South America, and as well as, of course, the Southeast Asia. Um, there will be quite a lot of the emphasis. In terms of imports, I think China will still for sure um, imports as well. So in the sense, I think um, China certainly wants to position itself as um, still a large market for a lot of the uh, multinational companies, because increasingly we're seeing that a lot of the multinational companies investing in China, not because then they can export, um, you know, back to the U.S. market or European market, because we know we now know that now it's becoming more challenged, but a lot of more multinational companies actually invest in China for China. So that's certainly, I think, um, where Chinese um, consumers, um, from a consumer perspective, I think Chinese governments still want to cultivate um, the fact that, you know, there needs to be openness in terms of importing of goods and service from overseas um, in the sense that, um, you know, it creates to uh, environment for multinational brands to compete in the Chinese market. And that will in the end also entice uh, further investment to go into China. So I think uh, both of the import and export area will be the focus for uh, the Chinese government, both encouraging uh, investment going into China as well as encouraging investment going out of China will be still the focus. But probably what has shifted is in terms of the sectors, that, um, in terms of receiving that uh, support, and as well as uh, their differentiation in terms of def destinations now uh, compared to what we've seen five or ten years ago. Okay, so it's a global shift likely to, well, uh, a shift in emphasis that we, we, we can anticipate. Um, I want to just give Yingjie and Bingqin a chance to speak on any international aspects that they might find um, in relation to either politics or social issues um, before we turn to questions. So if you've got questions, do start typing, start typing them into the uh, chat and we'll get to them in a few seconds. So uh, do I, I mean, you don't don't have to um, take up that opportunity if you don't want to, um, Yingjie and Bingqin. I just thought that you might want to do a global if you do if you do have something. Just two two points quickly, Louise, on the international front. Um, one is that the Chinese government's new shift towards um, new quality productivity um, productive forces is going to cause more. It's it's China. 2025 or, or China made 2025, whatever it's called, 
once again. So the friction between China and US and Europe and probably other countries is going to is going to intensify again. I think this is my this is my gut feeling. Uh, another point I would like to make is that the Chinese state is taking a very domestic approach to international politics. So it says, okay, we have we've been suppressed. We the foreign powers are trying to encircle us and trying to trying to contain us, but our response is actually the securitization of a, of a brand, broad range of things, including the tightening up of the internet and the financial sector and so on and so forth. So it's very much a domestic approach to international politics, which is, which is to me, interesting. Yeah, yeah, that is interesting. Yeah. Bing Qin? Uh, internationally, I think uh, particularly related to education and uh, the silver economy. And uh, these are actually in China uh, kind of a, a, a promoted not only for economic, uh, not only for social policy reasons, but it's also for economic innovation. So basically try, let's say, try to develop goods that your older people will uh, seriously need. So these kind of uh, um, these kind of innovation, I think actually uh, internationally quite a few countries have done it for a while, uh, like uh, Japan and um, uh, and also some other countries, <laughs> yeah, uh, Scandinavian yeah. countries, yeah. And uh, it's actually very important R and D, and China now also consider this to be their um, economic uh, new growth opportunity, new innovation opportunity. So then uh, these kind of things can potentially, we probably know better and uh, can potentially become uh, a new export uh, products or whatever. And also at the same time in Australia, what we can observe is that there are a lot of uh, uh, Chinese older people uh, immigrate uh, to Australia and they use service here. They use uh, kind of, um, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, they use care here and the health care, but uh, they come from the Chinese context and then they want to get uh, socially integrated here. And um, But then they find it particularly hard. The reason is that they have their own institutional memory back in China. Yeah. When they come to Australia, for example, you can see older people when they go to hospital here. They uh, if they uh, they haven't stayed here long, they go directly to the emergency. Right to emergency. In China, yeah. there's no <laughs> there's no, no GP. Yes, so um, that can potentially uh, cause uh, issues in Australia. So in order to understand, I think I highly recommend uh, people doing research on Australian social policy actually need to look out to all these immigrants, home country, not only China, but also other countries, and how people use their services when they come here, what adaptation they need in order yeah. to improve the service here. And um, so these are all, I think, are, are linked internationally as well. Yeah, so with the globally mobile population, this what you're saying makes perfect sense. We have to understand what people are coming to new environments with and as a institutional knowledge as, as social structures. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when you say it, it sounds so basic, but it's actually really, yeah, really yeah. Yeah. Actually, when you talk to people here, yeah. And um, uh, it's not, it doesn't appear to be so obvious. I was kind of. Yeah. 